Hey everybody, I'm Moose, and this is Playing With Powers. Last time on our History of Spider-Man games, we explored his early outings in the 80s, but today, we're looking at Spidey's 16-bit swan songs and his revolutionary leap to 3D. So max out your carnage, donate some plasma, and watch out for the Watcher, because this is part two, 1992 to 2002. The early 90s were a strange era for Spider-Man. James Cameron's efforts to make a big budget movie were dead in the water, see our video on that very subject for more info, and in the comics, flashier heroes like the X-Men were stealing the spotlight. Lucky for Marvel, less so for Peter Parker, the debut of Venom had injected some new blood into Spidey's rogues gallery. And in 1993, the two teamed up for their very own epic crossover, Maximum Carnage. Carnage, eh? I like the sound of that. Marvel rolled out all the stops for the second major appearance of their symbiotic slasher, with a sprawling 14-part storyline spread across the five different Spider-Man comics published at the time. And similar to what Star Wars would do with Shadows of the Empire a few years later, Marvel made Maximum Carnage a multimedia event. Its video game tie-in debuted on 16-bit systems with a massive advertising campaign, music by the alt-metal band Green Jelly, and special red cartridges that made them stand out on your shelf. But for all the hype, the game itself was only okay. It's a single-player brawler where you play as Spidey or Venom depending on the level, but for a beat-em-up, the enemy variety is really basic, and after destroying dozens of the same trench coat guys and ponytail girls, it gets a little repetitive. On the bright side, it's one of the first true adaptations of a comic book storyline. We've seen games use art inspired by panels before, but never to the extent of incorporating actual dialogue, plot, and crossover cameos from heroes like Cloak and Dagger or Firestar. There's even a post credits stinger where you face off with Carnage in the final battle after the first fake-out ending. Maximum Carnage was a massive hit, so the next year, Acclaim rushed out a sequel called Separation Anxiety, named after the 1994 storyline of the same name. But the game has more in common with Venom's original Lethal Protector run, with the introduction of the Life Foundation and the five spin-off symbiotes. Not that you'd notice, because the comic cutscenes were replaced with text, and the recycled gameplay and sprites make it even more of a slog to get through, although the added co-op and ability to select between Venom and Spidey is appreciated. As the 90s comics bubble burst, 616 Spidey would be mired in the controversial clone saga for the next two years. But lucky for us webheads, 1994 also gave us one of the most awesome Spider-Man adaptations ever in the animated series. Hot on the heels of their Smash X-Men show, Fox followed it up with the excellent Spider-Man. And while I'd rank it slightly below X-Men, for me at least, it was a gateway drug into the wonderful world of the Web Slinger, although the video game it inspired didn't have nearly as much impact. Released for the SNES and Genesis, the animated series game was yet another 2D platformer. More simple and straightforward than the earlier Spider-Man vs. the Kingpin, but with lush graphics inspired by the colorful cartoon. It might not win any awards for innovation, but it definitely didn't lack in the villains department. It featured over a dozen of Spidey's rogues, including baddies like the Jack-O-Lantern and a uh, Xenomorph who never actually appeared in the show. Unfortunately, the game was released in 1995, the same year the Sega Saturn and PlayStation came out in America, immediately making the old gen obsolete. The show itself would continue until 1998, but it only received that one adaptation, unless you count Spider-Man Cartoon Maker, and by all means, we should. Help! Independent of the animated series, we were treated to a couple more Spidey games as the 16-bit era wound down, like this Super Nintendo game called Lethal Foes, which featured incredible animations, super responsive controls, and the first video game appearance of Speedball. Unfortunately, US fans of superheroes named after deadly drug cocktails would have to wait since Lethal Foes was only released in Japan. Lastly, we've got Web of Fire, and with its pre-rendered Donkey Kong Country-style graphics and animated backgrounds, it's an interesting feast for the eyes. Unfortunately, it was released for Sega's 32X add-on after the company announced it was discontinuing support of the ill-advised accessory. Thank you. Thank you and today, the few copies that did sell are worth hundreds of dollars in the collector's market. Now, before we move on, I have to mention 1995's Marvel 
the first entry in Capcom's long-running crossover series that featured Spidey and his iconic sprite that would be reused all the way until Marvel vs. Capcom 2. But as for standalone Spider-Man games, we're about to enter a four-year dry spell. The animated series was canceled, lawyers were battling over Spidey's movie rights, and oh yeah, Marvel went bankrupt. But once the dust settled, the new millennium gave birth to one of my favorite games of the era, simply titled Spider-Man. Developer Neversoft was best known for their legendary Tony Hawk's Pro Skater series, which featured Spider-Man as an unlockable skater in the second installment. That's not a coincidence because their 2000 Spider-Man game came out the same year and runs on the same engine. Freed from the bounds of the second dimension, the polygonal Peter Parker faces a gauntlet of his most fearsome foes, culminating in a climactic battle against Dr. Octopus, who's been merged with the Carnage symbiote. It's an impressive effort for Spidey's first 3D outing, but Neversoft couldn't quite land the combo. In outdoor sections, you're not allowed to touch the ground thanks to some toxic gas that conveniently covers up the low draw distance. Also, as you swing through the sky, your webs don't actually attach to anything unless there are hundreds of conveniently placed helicopters hovering just above the skybox. These guys are serious. Meanwhile, the cramped indoor environments and obtuse camera made combat a bit of a pain, but I'm willing to forgive any gameplay foibles because the fan service is second to none. Neversoft's Spider-Man isn't based on an animated series, the then in development Sam Raimi movie, or any particular run from the comics. Instead, it's just a gushing love letter to the character, his supporting cast, and the entire Marvel Universe. I mean, right from Jump Street, Smile and Stan Lee himself narrates the whole game. Welcome, true believers and newcomers alike. Spider-Man co-creator Stan Lee here. Which is full of hidden comics. Golden. A cavalcade of cameos ranging from Captain America to the Punisher. Something tells me we have the same objective here. And even a wacky what if mode based on Marvel's long running alternate universe series. You already know the outcome of Spider Man's battle with Dr. Octopus, Carnage, and the symbiotes. But what if? What if this time, in this time's dream, some of the events unfolded differently? But my favorite aspect of Neversoft Spider-Man has to be the bonus costumes. As you played the game, or entered the cheat code True Believer, you'd unlock extra outfits that harken back to some deep cuts in Spidey history, like Miguel O'Hara's suit from Spider-Man 2099, the cosmic Captain Universe costume, and of course, the bombastic Bagman, a spare Fantastic Four uniform from when Reed first separated Spidey from the symbiote. Remember, this was well before Wikipedia, and these costumes helped introduce me to all sorts of Spidey lore I had no idea existed, kickstarting an obsession that led to me writing this very video. Also worth noting, these costumes were all absolutely free bonus content, but today you just know they would be paid DLC. The Neversoft game started on the PlayStation and was ported to most 5th gen platforms and spawned a few sequels for the Game Boy's Color and Advance, as well as a 32-bit follow-up the next year. Spider-Man Enter Electro was basically more of the same, although this time around you could at least bring Spidey down to street level. I will also give it props for this commercial that gave us a way more convincing Max Dillon than Jamie Foxx ever did. But the most interesting fact about Enter Electro is how it changed as a result of the real-life tragedy of 9-11. The game was set to release on September 18th, 2001, and it originally featured a final boss fight where you battled Electro across the Twin Towers. Where would you go to be on top of the world? I'm coming, Electro. Your power play ends tonight. <laughs> But just like Metal Gear Solid 2 and GTA 3, the game was delayed and heavily reworked to avoid referencing the World Trade Center. Games weren't the only Spidey media impacted by the attacks, however. Sony also had to recall their upcoming movie's infamous teaser trailer, where Spidey catches a helicopter on a web between the towers. Still, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man went on to smash box office records, solidify a new era of comic book movie dominance, and pave the way for the game that set the superhero standard. Next time on Playing With Powers, why didn't the first movie inspire an equally awesome adaptation? How did its sequel embrace the open world revolution? 
And why hasn't any Spider-Man game been able to touch it for 14 years? Thanks for watching everybody. I hope you liked part two of our look at Spider-Man games. What game from this era is your favorite? Do you like Maximum Carnage, the Neversoft game, or are you still making movies in Spider-Man Cartoon Maker to this very day? Leave a comment, let us know, stay tuned for part three, and as always, please subscribe to Now This Nerd.